heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Our Heavenly Father, as we open thy word today to begin this brand new series of studies I pray, Lord God, that you'll enlighten my mind and heart, speak to me, and speak through these lips of clay to the unseen tens of thousands across this great country. And Father, I beg and I pray, O God, in Jesus' name, that souls will be born again today. God grant that souls will be born again, even this first day of the series and we'll give God the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Get your Bibles now and turn with me to Mark chapter 10 for the text of the series of sermons. In Mark 10, we find the, the account of the rich young ruler coming to Jesus. Now, this young man came to Jesus, and after he went away, Jesus looked round about in verse 23, Mark 10:23. Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. Now notice, they were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that have uh, trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, and they were astonished out of measure. They were astonished out of measure. In other words, they just could not understand the Son of God making a statement like that. Astonished out of measure, saying... Among themselves, now here's my text, who then can be saved? Who can be saved? Now, of course, Jesus explained that with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now, with that verse of Scripture in mind, we're going to study who can be saved, what salvation is, and all the uh, things it have to do with getting salvation, keeping salvation, living salvation, knowing salvation, and so forth. But first of all, let's see, if you will, let us look at this scripture and see what happened to bring on the question, who can be saved? Now, I want to say this today in the very outset. I am not critical now, I understand that one dear man made the statement in a community where I was in revival. He made the statement that I thought I was right and everybody else wrong. Now, you know, beloved, you know, bless your heart, that's unfair. That's unfair. Now, I am a Bible preacher. I don't have one thing in my hand but the Bible. So help me. I don't have anything in front of me. I have no typewritten copy of this message. I have no books on salvation. I have the Bible. God bears me record. God's looking at me. You can't see me, but I'm not lying, and God knows I'm not lying. I have in my hand the Bible. That's all. Now, let me say this. I'm sorry that this man made the statement that I thought I was right and everybody else is wrong, because he's dead wrong. I know the Bible's right, and I know that everything else is wrong. But I've never made the statement that I'm right, you're wrong. If what I preach can be proven from simple, understandable, rightly divided truth, then it's right. And if it's not preached that way, it's wrong, whether I preach it or anybody else preaches it. Now, hear me. The words salvation, saved, redemption, new birth, 
Those words are not heard too often in the modern pulpit. Now, when I say modern pulpit, I mean the pulpit of today. Thank God there are many dear preachers who still invite people up to be born again, to be saved, to receive salvation. But most of the time, about all you hear, would you like to join us? Would you like to unite with us? Come up and shake the preacher's hand, and they'll take your name and ask you if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And they say, of course, some don't even ask that, but some do. And you say, I do, then you're voted in. Now, is that salvation, and is that uh, what the Bible means when it says that we must be born again, and except you be converted and become as little children, you shall in no case enter into the... Is that what the Bible means? Now, if it is, then I want to preach it. But if it isn't, then I want to declare that's not right. Now, you can brand me anything you want to. It doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I'll tell you, when you preach the gospel almost a quarter of a century... And uh, when you've been uh, lambasted and criticized and run down to the dogs and lied about and chewed on as much as I have, brother, it doesn't hurt you for somebody to say uh, some little silly something like, I think I'm right and everybody else is wrong. No, I know that there's nothing to me. The only thing good about me is the Savior inside of me. My flesh is just like all other flesh. And there's nothing good about me but God that dwells in me. But now I do have in my hand the Bible, and I dogmatically affirm and without apology declare the Bible's right, and everything else on the face of this earth is dead wrong, and I'll declare it till I die, and if you can't support that kind of preaching, then you can't support me, because I'm not for sale, my ministry is not for sale, and I refuse to deviate from thus saith the Lord God Almighty." Now, I want you to see this. This rich young ruler, in verse 17, 18, 19, and 20, notice it. He came, Jesus was going in the way, and there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Now I want to stop right there. Good master. Now the rich young ruler came running, and that's certainly commendable. He ran to Jesus. He fell on his knees. That's commendable. He kneeled down. Not much kneeling today. So preacher, why don't you stop criticizing, start preaching? I'm preaching. I'm preaching now. I'm not criticizing. You know, a lady came to my services some time ago, and she was told that I bowed on my knees to pray. And did you know that she came up after the service and told me that when I said, let us pray, she kept her eyes open to see if I really bowed. She said she didn't know that anybody bowed on their knees today to pray. Now, wait, I know that I'm not the only fellow that gets on his knees to pray. God bless your heart. God bless you. There are scores of you ministers listening to me right now. You get on your knees to pray. Yes, you do. And there are scores of you Christians who get on your knees to pray. But while there are scores that do, there are multiplied scores that do not. And we stand. I say we uh, sometimes when I'm at a microphone and I can't bow. I stand. But when it's where I can, I get on my knees. I like to get on my knees. I don't do it for a show. God knows I don't do it for a show. And I'm not saying that there's any virtue, any virtue in getting on your knees, but it certainly denotes humility. And you'll have to admit that quite a number of people, including a poor broken-hearted harlot, found salvation on her knees at the feet of Jesus. Now, I believe if Jesus should walk in this office right now where I'm uh, preaching, I believe I'd be compelled to get on my knees at his feet. I don't believe I could stand up in his face boldly and talk to him like I'd stand and talk to you. So when I pray, I'm talking to God. I want you to get that. I'm talking to God through the mediator, the Lord Jesus I'm not talking, God bless you, through a preacher or anybody else or anything else. I go to God boldly through the mediator, Jesus Christ. He is our mediator. 
Now the young man ran to Jesus, and he fell on his knees. That's commendable. But he approached him in the wrong way. Now listen. He said, good master, good master. Now that word master in the Greek is teacher. Good teacher. You're a good teacher. Oh, yes. Good teacher, tell me, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Teach me. Teach me. Now today we educate them into the church. Educate them into church membership. Say, preacher, why don't you start preaching the gospel and stop criticizing? I'm not criticizing, beloved. Facts are facts. You know, bless your heart, when it gets to the place that you can't state a fact, uh, when you're branded a critic and a fault finder for stating facts, then the country's in bad shape. But I want to serve notice on you that you cannot be taught into the kingdom, educated into the kingdom. You can't learn your way into the kingdom. You're born into God's kingdom. Now, the young man said, master, teacher, and that's what the word means, teacher, every minister listening to me that knows anything at all about the Greek language, they know that that word master can be and is translated teacher. Good teacher, teach me. Now then, Jesus tried to show that young man that he could be saved if he wanted to be saved. So he said, why callest thou me good? Why do you call me good? Now there's only one good, and that's God. Now let me show you. You know as well as I know that the people in the day of Jesus accused him of being an imposter, an illegitimate, born out of wedlock, and they did not believe that he was a son of God. He said, I'm the light of the world. They said, you're not. He said, I'm God's son. They said, you're not. You're bearing witness of yourself, and your witness is not true. You're not God's son. You're not the light of the world. You're not the bread from heaven. So they didn't believe. Now then, Jesus knew that this young man recognized his ability to work miracles and do marvelous works. And the young man and all of the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders recognized the unusual ability and power of the Son of God. So this young man says a lot of sweet things about Jesus, just like they do today. These liberals and modernists and back-scratching fellows, they talk about the good God, the good God. God's a good God, yes. Yes, he is. But why don't they tell you that he's a consuming fire? Why don't they tell you that he's angry with the wicked every day? Sure, God's a good God. If he wasn't, I'd be in the pit screaming right now. Some of you'd be right by my side. He's a good God. And they say a lot of good things. God is good. and God is love. And uh, God is great. And God is kind. God is compassionate. God is tender. And God wouldn't let the wicked burn in hell. And God this and God that. A lot of sweet things. A lot of nice things. A lot of good things. A lot of lovely things. A lot of lovely bouquets are being thrown at the feet of Jesus and the feet of God. And so this young man walked up to Jesus, uh, kneeled. He ran and kneeled. And he said, good master. Now, Jesus said, if I'm good, I'm God. So don't approach me as a good teacher. If you'll come to me kneeling and look to me as God, there's only one good and that's God. If I'm good, I'm God. If I'm good, I'm God. And if I'm not God, I'm not good. Now, if you want to do business concerning eternity, you'll have to deal with me as God. And that's what Jesus was, God in the flesh. Now, I'm a Trinitarian. Couldn't be anything else and believe the Bible. I couldn't be anything but a Trinitarian and believe the Word of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. No, I don't believe in three gods. I believe in one God manifest in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. That's the Bible, and that's the reason I preach it. No, I didn't say that I'm right and you're wrong. I said that's Bible, and that's the reason I preach it. God the Father loved us. God the Son died for us. God the Holy Ghost calls us, convicts us, draws us, borns us, and abides within us, seals us, leads us, guides us, and assures us, and fills us, praise God. Yes, I'm a Trinitarian, couldn't be anything else, and believe the Bible. I'd have to be, I must be, either a Trinitarian or an infidel. I must be a Trinitarian or an atheist. I cannot be 
anything but a Trinitarian if I believe the Bible. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Now Jesus said, if I'm good, I'm God. And if I'm not God, I'm not good. I'm an imposter, what you folks say I am. I'm an illegitimate, like you folks say I am. I'm not from God, like you folks say. Now, if I'm good, I'm God. If I'm good, I'm God. And if I'm not God, I'm not good. All right, now, what did the young, what did Jesus do now? He named six commandments, and I'm not going to read them because my time's slipping. Six commandments, and every one of them had to do with mankind. Not one of them had anything to do with deity. Now, the reason Jesus didn't name the commandments that have to do with deity, he knew good and well that this young man had another God. And if Jesus had said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now, that young man's image was his property, his money, his riches, his God was his money, his property, his riches. That was his God. It's not a sin to be rich, not a sin to make money, not a sin to own property, but it's a sin to make that your God. So he said, if I'm good, I'm God. If I'm not God, I'm not good. Now, he gave the commandments, six of them, but every one of them had to do with man, not God. Now, the young man said, I've observed all these from my youth. Jesus didn't say he had or hadn't. He didn't answer that, but he said, you like one thing, one thing. Now, here's what I want to drive home today in this first broadcast in this series of sermons. Here's what I want to drive home. The young man committed the sin that has damned every soul that's ever gone to hell. Cain went to hell because he committed the sin that the rich young ruler committed. I could go right on down the line and every person that has ever gone to hell since Adam. And of course, Adam didn't go to hell. Adam and Eve, uh, I believe as much as I believe I'm sitting at this desk delivering this message, I believe Adam and Eve are with God. They're, they're in paradise. I believe that. But every person that has died and gone to hell since God made man went to hell for committing the same identical sin that sent the rich young ruler to the pit. What is it? Jesus said, you like one thing. What is it? One thing. What is it? Sell what you have. Give it to the poor. Come. Take up thy cross. Follow me. And when he heard that, he turned away grieved and sad. He was very rich. Well, Brother Green, I suppose his riches damned him. No, sir. No, sir. His riches didn't damn him. In 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money, the love of money. The love of money, not the money, but loving it, trusting in it, and depending upon it, and resting in it and upon it. That's the sin. Not the money, but loving the money, trusting in the money. That's the sin. Now, hear me, please. Listen carefully, beloved. Listen. The rich young ruler committed the one sin, one thing thou lackest. You just like one thing, son, one thing, and you'll go to heaven. One thing, and you'll inherit eternal life. Just one thing. Sell what you have, give it to the poor, follow me. All right. What was the one thing he lacked? The one thing was trust. 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 He would not trust Jesus. He did not trust Jesus. Jesus said, I'll give you a treasure in heaven, a treasure. You'll be a spiritual multimillionaire. He did not trust Jesus. Had he trusted Jesus, he would have gotten rid of his possessions. He would have followed Jesus. The sin that damned him was the sin of unbelief, the sin of rejecting Jesus' words the sin of not obeying his invitation, the sin of unbelief damned the rich young ruler. And if you are so unfortunate as to drop into the pit, that will be the sin that will send you to the pit. If you burn in hell, it will be because you refused to trust Jesus, refused to take him at his word, because you refused to give him everything, everything, 
and keep back nothing. Lord, here I am, all I am, all I have, here I am. I believe you, I receive you, I trust you. And if you'll do that, he'll save you. Father, honor thy precious word, the shed blood of Jesus, and save the soul that's nearest hell. As I bring this first broadcast to a close in this series, Lord, please save somebody. Save that man that's nearest the pits of the damned. In Jesus' precious name, we'll give you the praise. Amen.